on. <clears throat> and how is my is my screen looking good? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Guys look good. Uh, Yuki, do you want to stay up for the intro, or do you want to kind of like hide and then pop on uh, once you're introduced? I'll hide. <laughs> okay. All right. Cool. So you, as soon as I see you disappear, I'm going to start the webinar. Welcome everyone. We are happy to welcome everyone in attendance to the next installment of our Art Escapes, which is our virtual tours through Asia. Today we will be highlighting Japanese bamboo art with Dr. Yuki Murashima. Uh, she is our guest today and will be participating in the Q&A after our video. Um, we're going to give people a couple more minutes to sort of file in and get comfortable. And we are very happy that you guys have been able to join us this evening. Or I guess it's the afternoon. I'm getting ahead of myself. It's not quite the evening. And if you have been with us before, you might be familiar with our programming format, but um, we're going to do our greeting and introduction, which is happening right now. We are going to play our tour video, which is Japanese bamboo art. And then we're going to have a question and answer portion. Um, right after the video. And if you guys have been with us before, you'll know that that's the opportunity for our viewers to ask our curator questions. And um, it's just a lot of fun. We like to keep it sort of informal and it's just a nice way to bridge the gap between uh, the guests uh, at the museum and our virtual guests and with our curators. And so it's a really exciting program that we're very happy to uh, have with you guys. And just before we really get started, we would like to acknowledge that the land that on which we're gathered is the ancestral home of the Ohlone peoples, and they stewarded this land for generations. We want to pay respect to the elders, past, present, and emerging. They hold the memories, traditions, and culture of their people across the nation. We extend our respect to the Ohlone Ramaytush, the coastal Miwok, as well as any other indigenous people who are present. And so if you guys, like I said, if you've been with us before, or if you've been in other webinars, um, we can go over a few controls before we really get started. We have the chat feature and we also have the Q&A feature. So if you put things into the chat, we will be able to see them. We have a helper, Nicole, on the other end who's overseeing the chat. And if you drop questions into the Q&A, uh, that's where we'll be able to see them and we'll be able to ask the curator. Sometimes we have people putting their questions for the curator into the chat. So we just like to remind everyone um, to kind of, you know, sort them out and we can do a little bit of practice. Uh, would you describe yourself as an artist? And if you're an artist, or if you just think that you find the art in the little things, um, what is your favorite kind of craft? And you can feel free to drop the answers in the chat so we can see what you guys are saying, or if you guys have like a, a craft. I was inspired to ask this question because of the topic of today's video. And I myself may not be an artist, but uh, I just recently painted my kitchen, which I think takes a little bit of craft. Let's see. Oh, we're getting some fun answers. Oh, we have a dancer, uh, multimedia, and also painting by Pauline. Oil painting and sewing. We have bird watching specifically duck watching. Let's see. Oh, baskets. How wonderful. Oh, very inspiring. Needle felting by Janet. Oh, that must be a lot of fun. Oh, and gardening. Oh, I love all that. Yeah, I think all of this stuff, even if it may not be, like gardening may not be technically classic art, but uh, I think it takes a lot of artistic flair. Absolutely. 
And let's see. So you guys know, speaking of art, um, our museum is open. We're so happy to be open on Thursdays. We're open from one to eight and our normal hours between uh, Fridays through Mondays, uh, except for Tuesdays and Wednesdays when we're closed, we give the art a little time to rest. Uh, we're open from 10 a.m. until 5 p.m. And we offer free general admission on the first Sunday of every month. And the next, what is the next one? It's coming up on the uh, 6th. It's June 6th is the next first free Sunday. So if you're in the area, come on by. We also have a lot of membership levels and uh, you get invitations to member preview days and like pre-sale for tickets. You have access to a virtual member lounge. There's parking discounts, um, free admission, not just on the first free Sundays, but any day that we're open for the collections and special exhibitions. So there's definitely a lot of benefits to being a member and we definitely encourage uh, our membership Cool to grow because there's definitely a lot of benefits. Let's see. And here's just a sneak peek of some of the things on view. We have uh, pieces by Chanel Miller. Uh, we have wonderful installations. We have uh, video installations. There's a lot of exciting things to see. If you haven't been able to visit us, uh, we definitely encourage it as we're open and we have a lot of things that we're really looking forward to being able to share with the public. And I've been talking a lot about the museum, but let me talk a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Sarah and I'm the supervisor of guest experience and group sales. You might see me running around the museum, um, helping with accessibility features, uh, helping with ticket sales. We uh, manage in guest experience, we manage the information desk and the concierge station. And when we're able to offer them, we do private tours and group visits. That's something that we really like offering. And again, accessibility resources. So we, uh, our department and myself, we really love to have all the departments work together and really make everything flow so that you guys can have a really nice experience. And now I would like to introduce our curator who we're so lucky to be able to have today. Uh, we have Dr. Yuki Morishima. She's the Associate Curator of Japanese Art, and she currently serves uh, us at the Asian Art Museum. Uh, she received an under, many undergraduate degrees, not just one, from the University of Washington and uh, an MS from the Boston University. She earned both her MA and PhD in Art History from the University of Pittsburgh, where she specialized in portraits of Japanese emperors. Prior to joining the Asian Art Museum, she taught uh, as a visiting instructor and a teaching fellow at the University of Pittsburgh, where my, uh, one of my very good friends is from. Since coming to the Asian Art Museum, she's curated and co-curated a number of exhibitions, including Kimono Refashioned, which is one of my personal favorites. I really love that exhibit. It was really a treat to be able to see that all the time as well as Japanese lacquerware, Looking East, which is how Japan inspired Monet, Van Gogh, and other Western artists, Tradition on Fire, which is contemporary Japanese ceramics from the Paul and Kathy Bissinger collection, and, uh, tet oh my gosh, my pronunciation, Tetsuya Ishida, Saving the World with a Brushstroke. And if you're interested in what else she's done, uh, her recent published writings include Ultra Subjective Space, an exploration of pre-modern Japanese spatial construction in Team Lab continuity, which is one of our upcoming exhibitions that we're all really excited about to have in our pavilion. And uh, Japonism in art and fashion, in kimono fashion, Japanese impact on international fashion, and Asian Art Museum of San Francisco collection highlights. So a lot of great things from our very own collection. And currently she's working on the Heart of Zen and Gibbons at Play special exhibition slated for 2023 and planning for the Japanese art gallery rotations. So you'll be able to see a lot of things that she's working on in our museum. And we're really happy to have you here today. We're very excited. Thank you so much for the warm introduction. Um, I'm excited to introduce you to the intricate construction and subtle elegance of bamboo art. 
So currently, um, there are 22 works on view in the Bamboo Art Gallery. And those um, works have never been displayed at the museum before. So this is the first time, which is exciting. And um, I will highlight some of the baskets today and then talk about a contemporary piece, which will be included in the next gallery rotation starting on July 1st. So please enjoy the gallery tour to learn about the creative um, evolution of Japanese bamboo art. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Yuki Morishima. I'm the Associate Curator of Japanese Art at the Asian Art Museum. Welcome to the Japanese Bamboo Art Gallery. In this gallery, you see a selection of bamboo works dating from the late 18th century to the present day. Some of them are traditional works in the classical form, such as functional containers for flower arrangements. They're made using traditional bamboo weaving techniques. Others are contemporary works that are purely sculptural in form. This installation showcases the breadth of innovation, creativity, and technical accomplishments of Japanese bamboo artists. It is said that bamboo baskets have been used in Japan since the Jomon period which is from 10,500 to 300 BCE. By the late 1800s, Japanese artists were producing intricate baskets in a variety of styles. But bamboo works have always been considered as a craft. It is only recently that bamboo works gained much deserved recognition and entered art museum collections our collection at the Asian Art Museum was not an exception. In 2002, we received a gift of over 800 baskets from the collector Lloyd Kotzen. As a result of this acquisition, the Asian Art Museum holds one of the largest and most notable collections of bamboo art outside of Japan. Mr. Kotzen, Former CEO and chairman of the Neutrogena Corporation began collecting in the 1970s. He assembled his collection during the course of what he called a 40-year love affair with Japanese bamboo baskets. By the early 2000s, he had built a collection of unparalleled scope and quality. In explaining their appeal, he said, I was attracted by the tensions created by the balancing of forces, of cohesion and chaos, structure and nature, refinement and exuberance, and ultimately, simplicity and complexity. Mr. Kotzen's recognition of bamboo as an art form and his delight in the expressive power of sculptural bamboo ignited the interest of other collectors and museums around the world. The Asian Art Museum's bamboo art collection is well recognized in the world. For example, we organized the Masters of Bamboo exhibition, which traveled to Suzhou Museum in China in 2018, showcasing 69 superb bamboo works from our collection. We are delighted that over 213,000 visitors came to see this exhibition in China. Here in San Francisco, we always have about 25 bamboo artworks on display at any given time. This installation ranges from anonymous traditional baskets to signed works by the most important bamboo artists active since the 19th century. Tanabe Chikun Sai II is one of the most well-respected bamboo artists. He created this urn-shaped basket with a handle 
It's woven in an irregular plate with strips of rich red-brown bamboo. The base of the basket is squared, but the body of the basket becomes rounded directly from the base. The rim is made from bundled and wrapped body elements. The handle of this basket is a bent bamboo branch with some tiny branches intact. Insect stitching is used decoratively on the handle that is tied to the sides of the basket on opposing sides. Thin twigs from the handle branch are bent down, inserted, and attached with rattan in insect wrap stitches to the surface of the basket. The one end of the handle is supported with an insect stitch wrapped hoop which is sewn to the rim. Usually, a flower basket comes with a removable, lacquered bamboo water container called otoshi. The one for this basket is lined with copper. As you can see here, the water container can be hidden in the basket, or it can be more visible and become part of the design as you see in the basket over here by Kajiwara Koho. When you place the water container full flower arrangement, it can be a beautiful part of the design. Kajiwara's basket is made of fine bamboo strips that rest on the foot ring. The vertical strips then rise and fan out of the rim using what we call a thousand line construction. The thousand line construction is technically not a plating technique. It involves not interlacing bamboo strips, but aligning stiff strips in parallel and securing them at the end. As you can see, the wrapped rim has a beautiful undulating elliptical shape. When you peek inside this basket, you will realize that the bottom of the simple looking basket is actually woven in a quite complex way. When you look at the basket from the side, you notice that the narrow horizontal section just above the foot is woven in what we call a jumping mat plate technique. Here's another example of a thousand line construction. This simple and beautiful cylindrical basket made by Matsuzawa Kazuyoshi is titled Many Lines. The vertical strips are secured in place about one-fourth up from the base with an internal rib wrapped with dark brown dyed rattan. Both the rim and base are banded and stitched also with dark brown rattan. Higashi Takesonosai applied a variation of thousand line construction to form this box-shaped basket titled Bamboo Grove. Here, bamboo strips are secured in place in a random way, and their ends are stitched to the rim with rattan. The low handle is a whole piece of bent bamboo, which is set off center and joined to the rim on either side. As the title indicates, the basket makes me think of the dense, lush green bamboo grove. Takesonosai was from the Kansai region, so it's very likely that he was inspired by the famous bamboo grove in Arashiyama, Kyoto. This is a writing box by Koko. The lid of the box is clear lacquered with a lead applique of grape leaf design. The interior is lined with a smaller bamboo mat with Cuts up for a slate ink stone and a curled up rabbit shaped iron water dropper. What's interesting about this box is that it is made from a node of timber bamboo. The artist cleverly used the distinctive characteristic of bamboo, a segmented stem, to create the box. Notice the middle section of the bottom, the part which is colored brown is sliced off to create a flat surface, making the box stable. 
Higas Takesono Sai created this large half ovoid shaped basket. Its width is about 29 inches long. Takesono Sai titled this flower basket Stone in a Stream. It is like a smooth stone which juts above the water's surface. The narrow strips of light brown bamboo run lengthwise across the basket in thousand lined construction. The strips near the top part have been bent to create a rippled effect. They are sewn in place with meandering light colored rattan stitches signifying the flowing water currents. On the contrary, the bottom of this piece is woven like a mat. Notice there is a dark strip of bamboo inserted in the middle as a signature panel. There is a circular opening at the top of the form to hold a water container. How would you arrange flowers in this artwork? Imagining how to arrange some flowers is another way to enjoy the bamboo baskets in this gallery. Instead of inserting flowers with long stems, I would drape some flowers over and down the basket as if they are floating downstream. Nagakura Kenichi also expresses water in his flower basket. He titled this hollow basket, Rapid Stream. He is known for creating unconventional, organic forms, treating bamboo more like a sculptural medium. Here, the irregular direction of bamboo strips and the bumpy surface express water running down a rocky cliff. Some strips are emanating from the node at the neck of the basket. They have been split and woven into a haystack-like form. The basket is open on the bottom and has a small woven basket which is attached to the underside of the mouth to hold a narrow metal water container. Nagakura spent years learning traditional bamboo techniques from his grandfather before innovating his own style. The artist explains, bamboo is an ideal material to express nature. Bamboo can be either delicate like a spider web or solid as stone, thus embodying the natural cycles of the world. Morita Chikuamida IV created this roughly and randomly woven gourd-shaped basket. He used very fine bamboo with some wider inserts scattered in a bird's nest-like manner. It has a flat woven base with a 1.5 inches diameter hole in the front. It has also a twisted stem at the top. The thin bamboo strip is wound throughout the basket and exits at the top. It loops over and down and wraps around the waist and rejoins the body of the basket. Most bamboo artists underwent strict traditional apprenticeships. When possible, I select and arrange the artworks to show the generational progression of artists within teacher-student lineages. Through such relationships, we can see the transformation of bamboo work from a sophisticated, technique-driven craft into a creative and often sculptural means of artistic expression. The four generations of Tanabe Chikunsai are a good example. Tanabe Chikunsai I who studied under Wadawa Chiksai I, created this basket titled Whole Replete with Happiness and Longevity. Chikunsai I was skilled in making Chinese-style baskets like this one. Chikunsai II followed his father's signature styles, but he also developed his own style. This cylindrical gourd-shaped basket of very fine bamboo strips is made with his signature open-work hexagonal plating. Chikunsai II advanced recognition of bamboo craftsmanship. Chikunsai III 
learned bamboo crafts from Chikun Sai, the first leading apprentice, Okubo Shochikusai. He successfully exhibited his works at the Nitten and the Japanese traditional art and crafts exhibitions. He also began creating some sculptural bamboo works. This one is titled Core. Chikun Sai the Fourth studied under his father, Chikun Sai the Third, but he also studied sculpture at Tokyo University of the Arts, where he created bamboo sculptures. This is one of my favorite works called Disappear by Chikun Sai the Fourth. The museum commissioned the artist to create this piece, which provides a great contrast with the rest of the more utilitarian and traditional baskets from the Lloyd Kotzen collection. Deceptively simple looking, Disappear is a technically challenging work with complex rotations determined by a mathematical algorithm. Standing nearly three feet tall, this object is made of thin bamboo strips. It's the 12th work from his Disappear series. Based in Sakai, Japan, Chikun Sai IV is highly regarded for his mastery of traditional techniques and his integration of innovative vision in creating both colossal site-specific installations, such as this work, Connection, installed at the Asian Art Museum for the summer of 2019, as well as smaller sculptural works, such as Disappear. While his family tradition continues to be an integral part of his identity as an artist, he constantly looks for new ways to present bamboo. For the Disappear series, he collaborated with Harvard architecture professor Sawako Kaijima, who is known for her interdisciplinary approach integrating computational design. After months of experiment, they created new computer-aided designs to construct bamboo sculptures. Professor Kaijima developed a computational design and made small resin molds with a 3D printer to create the works in the Disappear series. Chikun Sai then employed bamboo weaving techniques and inserted bamboo strips between the mold pieces which were removed to reveal complex forms. These forms are dynamic and previously unattainable by using traditional techniques alone. The artist explains it's a fusion of technology and traditional decorative arts. Chikun Sai's Disappear will be on view from May 13th until January 17th. In the 21st century, the practice of bamboo art in Japan is diverse. A new generation of Japanese bamboo artists continues to explore the technical and expressive possibilities of bamboo. Every eight months, I select a new group of 25 or so bamboo artworks from our vast collection to change the display. That means you would encounter something new each time you visit. Please come back often to our Japanese Bamboo Art Gallery. That was amazing. I'm, I'm every time we watch one of those videos, I, I always learn something. And uh, Nicole and I, who've done these uh, webinars, are we're in the museum almost every day that we're open, and it's so amazing that uh, getting to watch these videos, how it, they highlight things, and we just learn things every single time. I'm really excited to get to see those videos. So thank you so much for oh, being such a great presenter and. Uh, yeah, really looking forward to getting to know what people are asking. Um, so if you guys feel inspired to ask some questions, 
please drop them into the Q&A. And if you're sort of giving yourself some time to think, or if you want to see what other people are asking, or if you want to, you know, just have a moment, we're going to launch a really quick poll to give you guys a little bit of buffer time. And we wanted to ask you, uh, now that you've been so inspired by our most recent video, we are planning on launching an additional monthly program uh, in addition to this one, which is Art Escapes Exhibition Excursions Edition. Uh, ooh. <laughs> so we wanted to ask you guys what times or what times would work best with your schedule. And so I'm going to launch this poll and feel free to let us know um, if there is any particular time that works best for you, because we really love hosting these events and we want to keep it up. And so we want to see what works best with our audience's schedule. You may have seen this poll before because we are trying to incorporate it a little bit more so we can get some live uh, feedback from our actual participants. It looks like, oh, Saturday at 4 p.m., a very popular time. And I'll just keep this up for a few more seconds. So please feel free to, if you've already answered, drop your questions in the Q&A and we will get this started in just a few moments. Okay, somebody, somebody has to play the Jeopardy music. <laughs> we have a couple <laughs> more seconds. Okay. And we have about, oh, oh, about 75% of people voted. <laughs> oh, I know, I, I was about to end it, but then the numbers went up. So, <laughs> okay, I am going to end this. We have about 75%. And, oh, wow, it looks like Saturday at 4 p.m. How convenient <laughs> people are used to our schedule. Okay, thank you guys so much for voting. We really appreciate it. Okay, and let us launch right into the Q&A. All right, so our first question is, would bamboo weaving be a craft done by the general public or was it more common for artists to create the baskets? Um. I'm sure there are some people who made their own bamboo baskets for daily use, but the baskets with intricate design, complicated plating techniques, I think those can be only made by the specialists. specialists. So I would say uh, mainly uh, this was done by artists. And you mentioned that they, in the video, they go through sort of a long training process mm -hmm. and it's, do you know, a kind of a guess of like how long that process might be if they would be do an apprenticeship or like how long would that training be? Uh -huh. So traditionally, um, apprenticeship was the way to, you know, learn bamboo art. But nowadays, I, you know, understand that there are universities giving classes so you could measure in, you know, bamboo art. So that's a, you know, sort of well, relatively new a way to learn about this craft. And um, I heard that there is a saying that um, a, an apprentice has to learn how to split bamboo for three years. And then um, it'll take about eight years to learn how to weave and plait. So for the first three years, you're supposed to just go and split bamboo. <laughs> So that's I, the training I hear. <laughs> I don't think I have the patience for that. I'm going to leave it up to the people that love that. <laughs> and that sort of but ties in, into... In the meantime, you're supposed to, you know, look at your master and learn and steal some techniques. But, you know, you're not supposed to um, make your own artwork for quite some time. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's too long for me. I'm not patient enough. <laughs> and... On that note, what can you sort of speak on what you feel the future is of bamboo art in Japan? Because you mentioned the universities. Is that uh, something that's offered or really loved in a more modern sense? Mm. I am not sure, but I know that there are so many um, um, apprenticeship and certain families 
had tradition of you know ha having um, bamboo masters, but that tradition is ending. I heard that there are like several famous um, bamboo families before, but now there's only one, which is Tanabe family, Tanabe Chikunsai family. So things are changing. Maybe people are learning, you know, bamboo art more from universities nowadays, but um, I'm not certain. However, um, there are many um, exciting artists making exciting artworks um, using bamboo. So, um, yeah, I think it is an exciting field and it is changing. And I also want to mention that there are many female artists nowadays, which is really great. And I think bamboo art has been, you know, sort of male dominant kind of field, but um, it has been changing slowly. And um, yeah, there are some um, wonderful female artists. So, you know, I think it's, uh, uh, it's exciting to follow those artists as well. I would like to show some female artists' works um, at the museum in the future. Do we have a large collection of female artists in our collection, or uh, is at it all? As you oh, probably no. guessed, so we gotta change that. <laughs> and is the museum still, I mean, actively collecting baskets? Um, Answer is yes, but um, well, let me explain. So yes, and uh, we actually acquired 60 or so, about 60 or so bamboo artworks this year. So it's exciting. Wow. However, those were actually promised gift by the Kotzen Foundation. So this was arranged many, many years ago. And um, at this point, we have about, well, over 950 baskets in our collection so we're not actively um, acquiring more so we're very selective at this point because you know we have a lot <laughs> so um, we would probably accept bamboo artworks signed by very famous artists or you know something like that <laughs> and i sort of envision the bamboo as bamboo is very durable but it Seems it seems so delicate. Where do where does the museum keep our art? Is it on site or do we keep it somewhere else? Because nine hundred baskets seems like it would take a bit of space. You're absolutely right. We do not have any storage <laughs> in our uh, museum, so we have off site. Storage. Okay, great. Yeah. And let's um we're, let's jump back into some more technical questions. We're getting a few of those, and the baskets they are some of them are different colors mm -hmm. is that an artistic expression are they dyed or is that I don't know a tremendous amount of, about bamboo are does bamboo range in color or do they have to be dyed um there are some bamboos which would come with um some sort of patterns on the surface so for example tiger bamboo would have um some you know tiger like um pattern on the bamboo. And there is a sesame uh, seed bamboo, which also comes with that sort of different texture. Um, but they're very rare. And artists in Japan often use um, madake. It's a type of um, bamboo. And it's pretty simple, you know, the bamboo you usually see. And um, the color changes because the artist usually apply um, lacquer. So it could be clear lacquer, you can see through, you know, bamboo original color, or, you know, um, the artist could use, um, you know, colored lacquer. And when they're creating the baskets, do they, is there a specific process? Are they able to take, you said there's about <laughs> a few years of uh, learning when it just comes to just the bamboo. And is it woven in a specific way when it's wet or if it, do they do it while it's dry? Are you aware of like sort of the technique in that way? Um, usually bamboo strips are wet because the moisture makes it more pliable, more flexible. So um, they do wet it first before weaving. And um, so what was the second question? I'm sorry. 
<laughs> um, if it's uh, just woven when it's dry or if it's wet. Oh, so um, yeah, wet. <laughs> so um, if you have participated in a bamboo workshop here at the museum, you know, we prepare like little water spray bottle. So you can oh, spray you know, as you work on the um, your uh, flower basket. I recall working here when we hosted those events and mm -hmm. I was jealous of everyone. I didn't uh, participate, but oh, I, so saw what everyone, <laughs> <laughs> I saw what everyone was making and I was like, oh, I want to do that. That looks like fun. It is fun. I, yeah, let's host this kind of thing again. You know, we invited um, an artist from Japan back in, um, what was that? Uh, 2016, I think it was Fujitsuka Shose, and uh, and you may remember Tanabich Kunsai also gave a workshop. So we do have those, you know, once in a while. I mean, it's pandemic and all, so it's a little difficult right now. But we should start planning. So in a year or two, you know, we can invite an artist and we can have a workshop and we can all make flower baskets. That would be fun. Maybe this time uh, I'll get to do it, and uh, everyone that's in it attendance virtually come on down to the museum <laughs> and we have another question which uh, i always think is really fascinating Do, because i view bamboo as sort of being a really durable material mm -hmm. and really loved for its uh, ability to withstand water and things like that does the does a bamboo basket have a finite life and can you speak about any conservation issues when uh, looking and preserving at bamboo works? Mm. Um, bamboo is really durable, but you know, obviously it's not gonna last forever. <laughs> but um, yeah, relatively, I think it's pretty strong material. Plus, like I mentioned before, um, some of them are coated with lacquer, which makes it you know, even more stronger and, you know, um, against moisture and bugs. So, um, yeah, we have baskets from like 17th century and they're still in pretty good shape. So, however, you know, the earlier baskets, um, we don't have them because they are, you know, really used. They're artworks, but they weren't considered as artworks before. And they're just beautiful um, utilitarian, you know, tools that they, you know, the Japanese people used. So many of them didn't last, you know, and, um, yeah. <laughs> and besides the sort of utilitarian component, uh, they were used for flower arranging and what, were there any other uses in daily life um, besides the flowers? Would, would they be used for like market baskets or you mentioned that they were water jugs? Were there any other uses like that? Um, yeah, in our collection, we have baskets for um, to hold charcoal and we have baskets for food. And um, what else do we have? We have all kinds of stuff. Like I said, we have 950 or so. <laughs> so, I mean, they're a lot, you know, they're like simple trays. And then on the other hand, we have many bamboo sculptures, you know, they're not utilitarian, but they're also very exciting pieces. But the um, majority of the baskets are used for flower arrangement. And um, I think it was Tanabe Chikunsai who told me that, you know, because in Japan, we have flower arranging culture, the bamboo flourished. So they kind of go hand, you know, like together. <laughs> and we obviously have a lot of baskets in our collection and you're uh, working on presenting them through rotation. Are there other museums in the US that have that you're aware of that have a large bamboo basket collection that you like visiting or maybe not even a large collection, just something that you really love that you get to see in the US? Mm -hmm. um, recently, I think it was like two years ago or so, the Met Metropolitan Museum in um, New York City, they acquired a large um, collection donation. It's called Abbey Collection. So they just got a lot of them <laughs> quite recently though. 
And um, in Japan, uh, Tochigi Museum, Tochigi Prefectural Museum owns a lot of baskets. And if someone was interested, this is kind of a fun question. Um, if someone was interested in starting their own collection, are these, pre I mean, obviously they're the well-loved ones, they're the older ones, ones from renowned artists, but if someone was beginning their own collection, are they present in markets? Are they kind of a, a loved craft that's available today or are they more reserved for uh, collections like in museums? Uh, no, you can purchase them at um, quite reasonable price, but I'm not supposed to talk, supposed to talk about prices. So <laughs> I better stop here. <laughs> uh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah that's available. a big, uh, that's a big yeah, no, no. With the IRS will start participating in the <laughs> Q&A if we talk about pricing too much. <laughs> okay, so let's see. Um, Oh, this is kind of a fun one. Why are the incredible baskets done primarily in Japan and not in other Asian countries? Mm. Well, I'm Japanese, so I'm, you know, um, biased. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Japan, no, just kidding. But um, actually Chinese people made really wonderful baskets and, um, you know, Japanese artists always learn from Japanese, I mean, the, I'm sorry, Chinese baskets. So they, they do a wonderful job as well. And is it common for, well, I guess not common, but do you ever see embellishments like flowers woven into the baskets? I feel like what we were looking at were a lot of beautiful natural forms that highlighted the weaving and pattern techniques. Do you ever see anything represented in the baskets like human figures, which seems like it would be really complex, maybe not to a renowned artist, but do you ever see like flowers or animals or people represented within this weaving? Um, you mean the shapes, right? Yeah. Um, so in our collection, we have bamboo baskets in the shape of a turtle, a turtle with tail <laughs> and a carp and, oh, and a cicada. How timely <laughs> we have that. And we also have a carved um, bamboo root in the shape of a man's face. So we, we do have those. And also um, typical shape would be like ships. There, yeah, you see a lot of ships. <laughs> Is it, flower was basket. it what, do you know why ships were so common? Mm, I'm not sure, I don't know, but I they also have, um, oh, well, we have this in our collection too. We have an um, ox cart shaped flower basket. So yeah, it comes in all kinds of different shapes. It was just in vogue at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this is kind of a fun question. Uh, what are some of the bamboo works that we have from the distant past? Like what are some of the oldest pieces we have in our collection? Oldest piece. I think, um, well, we have the charcoal basket from the 17th century. I think that's probably the oldest we have. A lot of pieces we have are from the mm, 19th century. Yeah, and, and contemporary. And also we have, uh, it's not a basket though, but we have bamboo um, tea scoop, which is from the early 17th century. That we know this because we know the artist who uh, carved the scoop, so, yep. And can you explain the process of the smoked bamboo? And, or let's see, do you have any examples of smoked bamboo on display? And can we uh, explain the process? Uh, I No, I don't think we have that uh, currently on view, but um, what I understand is that, um, so those bamboo pieces are actually, were left in a kitchen, like countryside house kitchen where, you know, people cooked. So the bamboo, you know, got smoked and then obtained color. So, um, it's very rare. Yeah. And, and, you know, it takes hundreds of years to, you know, 
smoke and color <laughs> bamboo. So um, it's difficult to find. And I don't know if we have any in our collection. I should look that, into that. That sounds like it would be definitely a more utilitarian application of the baskets in people's homes, sort of right in the kitchen. Yeah, well, but I think these are um, bamboo combs, you know, bamboo itself, and um, it, it doesn't have to be a ready-made basket. Does it make sense? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And let's see, we have a couple more minutes for questions and we're getting this question a few times. Um, was bamboo always used or are there examples of other materials that were used in a similar fashion? I see, um, bamboo has been always used. Like the, you know, like I mentioned in the video, um, there was an example from very earlier on and uh, bamboo was, um, widely available. So for example, you know, you might think about, you know, rattan piece, but rattan wasn't available in Japan. So bamboo was, you know, the main material that they used. Um, so yeah, I mean, people did use that throughout history. And can you describe the difference between rattan and bamboo and oh, sort gee. of their application? <laughs> <laughs> or is that too big? Um, no, no, no. <laughs> So rattan, I believe, is uh, uh, from the palm family, and I know it's solid. The bamboo has, you know, a hollow, hollow inside, right? But rattan is not; it's solid. And um, well, they're both light, durable, strong. You know, they're they're wonderful materials. But um, rattan was not available in Japan, really. So you know, um, people use bamboo more. And what else do I know about rattan? Rattan, mm, Japanese people use those to um, secure. So it's, it's like a, they tie it, you know, tie the uh, bamboo strips with rattan. And um, I don't know if they widely use, you know, that material to make baskets. And in addition to the baskets and tea scoops, are there other common objects that would be made out of bamboo? Oh boy, <laughs> it could be. Um, hmm, common objects. Uh, so I'm thinking about tea room because you mentioned tea scoop. <laughs> so futaoki, the um, lid rest and things like that is always made with bamboo. And um, in Japan, people use bamboo to cook. I mean, of course, bamboo shoot, you know, people eat those, but um, like you would wrap food in bamboo and steam them. And, you know, I mean, that's not really um, art for, <laughs> well, I guess food is also art. <laughs> Kind of the first question I had where uh, the introductory question, which is what, what kind of art do you like? I think cooking is art. <laughs> for sure, for sure. And um, sort of on that note, um, it looks like in the chat and the Q&A, we're getting a lot of interest uh, around workshops. And mm -hmm. that sort of is would be more of an offering from our public programs department. Yeah. But are you aware of how some of our viewers can learn to make their own baskets. Um, we have a specific question. Where could you learn Japanese basketry in the Bay Area? Or That's are you, question. we've got a lot of questions. Um, or if there's any films that you would recommend or maybe documentaries about bamboo weaving. Mm -hmm. um, there is a documentary like film uh, created by uh, Bunkacho, the cultural agency of Japan, I think is how it, they translate themselves, <laughs> Bunkacho, and um, they created a video on bamboo art. So that's something that you could watch. But unfortunately, I think, I think um, there is no English, but I have to double check on that. <laughs> <laughs> You're on the spot, so we don't expect uh, <laughs> you to know right away. Um, and we only have a couple more, like just a few more minutes for questions. Are you, and I wanted to ask, um, have you done any basket weaving yourself or do you kind of leave it up to the artists in the collection? Oh, I have tried. <laughs> well, just, you know, uh, during the workshop though. So, 
nothing too serious. And I didn't, you know, do apprenticeship for three years and then eight years, <laughs> nothing like that. But um, I have tried and it's a lot of fun. So um, yeah, I would love to uh, hold another workshop and we can all, you know, enjoy <laughs> making and artwork. And as a curator, I believe that I have to be hands-on and I want to always try making art you know so i can talk about it without making something by myself i don't think i'm qualified to talk about it for like for example ceramics you have to be hands-on you know play with clay you have to do that in order to teach or you know um, appreciate it fully i think so painting i have done i mean i have studio art background so i think it's it's important for art an art historian to be hands-on absolutely that's, i feel like uh, I, I believe <laughs> i'll try and do little paintings and then suddenly i have such a stronger appreciation for mm -hmm. all the artists that uh right. i'm like oh wait a minute no that's actually requires a lot of talent <laughs> and um so, so this is going to be our last question and it sort of ties into what's on display right now. And how do you decide which artists to put on display? Is, well, are there themes? Good question. Do you go with themes or the Japanese baskets are really close to some of our ceramics and mm -hmm. we have like the tea house right there. Do you correspond with other curators when selecting the baskets to display? Um, so I decide what to display in the gallery, in the bamboo gallery by myself. <laughs> I don't really consult. <laughs> but, um, well, there are more than, you know, 950 baskets. So I usually select uh, works that, you know, that hasn't been displayed before. Um, so I purposely pick new baskets every time I, you know, um, think about my object list. And um, I include baskets with a variety of shapes and colors. And, um, uh, and I also um, try to include at least one contemporary work, like sculptural piece in a rotation. Yeah, th those are the things that I think about when I'm selecting objects. Oh, and also if I can, you know, find generational relationship, then, you know, I would usually yeah, select a few of those teacher student relationship and you know yeah and the uh chikunsai disappear is going to be on view from july 1st yes uh, july until, 1st yeah until the end of february of next year so okay. that's a piece that we can really invite you guys uh everyone to see um we love having these works on display and uh, we're really excited for people to be able to come back to the museum. And yeah, I think that's all the time we have for questions. And thank you so much for being thank here you. with us. I'm sure the audience uh, really appreciated it. And we got a lot of really great questions. And I'm really looking forward to uh, getting to see the baskets in the gallery and all the rotations that are ready to be put out and just kind of waiting in storage to uh, see a lot of guests. <laughs> and uh, I want to, yeah, thank everyone who participated. Thank you to Yuki and thank you, Nicole and Ted, who are on the back end of things, helping me out with uh, the technicals. And we are so happy to be open. We're so happy to be doing these programs. If you get a chance to visit us, we have our first free Sunday coming up soon. And right before that, on the 5th, we have another Art Escapes. I hope everyone would want to sign up for that. Uh, it is the Art of the Himalayas. And we're really looking forward to hosting that. And we, I was so happy to be able to have this conversation with you. Thank you so much for answering all these questions. I really Thank enjoyed you. getting to spend this time with you. So Thank you to our participants. Thank you to everyone uh, who helped to make this possible. And we hope to see you in the museum soon. Okay, thank you everyone.